Good morning from the Utah Valley University Office for Global Engagement. I'm your host, Baldomero Lago, and I welcome you to Global Dialogues. Uh, during this session, feel free to ask questions in the Facebook comments window. If time permits, I will address a select few. And today, our distinguished guest is Madame Ang Lea. Uh, my apologies for the delay in starting uh, Global Dialogues today. Apparently, we have had a technical issue, but we are now in our company with, uh, with her distinguished guest. As a brief introduction, uh, Madame Lair was recognized by the State Department as the Honorary Consul of France back in 2017. Uh, so she's been in the system for four and a half years as a diplomat representing the interests of France here in our community. Uh, she's a native of France, uh, from France, uh, from, from around the city of Pau, and uh, moved to the United States to uh, go to school. And uh, she earned a PhD in 19th century French culture and literature from Ohio State University. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, she is a Buckeye grad and I have a lot of good friends from Ohio State. So this is great. She is uh, well published. Uh, she has multiple articles and a book on symbolism of food and co-author beginning and intermediate textbooks in French. Uh, I must add that uh, I'll be treating um, Professor Lair as Madame Lair because she was recognized by the Ministry of National Education of the Republic of France with the title of a Knight of the Order of Academic Palms, which is a high prestigious recognition. This uh, order of academic palms is a national order and, uh, and, uh, and a medal. And it was created by Napoleon Bonaparte in 1808 to recognize outstanding members of the University of Paris. And his modern form, the award uh, may be granted to individuals making extraordinary achievements in the realms of French education and culture. And is very uh, honorable and distinguished the career that, that Madame Blair has had, uh, not only professionally at the university level, but also throughout our community here in the state of Utah. I must also add uh, that uh, Madame Alea served for three years as the president of the Alliance Française in Utah. So we are very honored to have you join us, Madame Lair, in this virtual setting. Thank you, thank you, thank you for taking the time to share with us a few thoughts today. And uh, if I may add, um, as uh, your role as an honorary consul of France, um, what does the French community look like? Let us know, tell us a little bit about France and Utah and some of the duties and responsibilities that you do. Absolutely, well, Dr. Lago, thank you so much for organizing those global dialogues. I am envious to see everything you do. Uh, you are also the honorary uh, consul to Spain here in Utah, and so you know what it means. So I have prepared a little uh, PowerPoint. Uh, I thought that would be a nice, uh, and that would be also a support, you know, when you're a professor, you tend to have your support. So uh, I started uh, actually a little bit before that uh, when I was already the, uh, the president of the Alliance Francaise and when we needed to issue passports. We have a large community. Uh, I have included some, uh, some numbers here. So, and I love what I do, but it's not always easy because each situation is different. So I am attached to the French consulate in San Francisco region uh, which is the 12th largest uh, French consulate in the world. We have a minimum of 29,000 French people. And so I, I requested uh, numbers, okay? And they mentioned, but Anne, it can be twice or three times because we do not know everyone and not everyone has expressed the desire to, uh, to register on the, uh, on the listing of the French consulate. So here in Utah, we have about between 1,500 and 3,000. Again, we have to be flexible. And they are mostly in the Salt Lake City area, what I mean between Ogden and, uh, and Provo. And then down in St. George, where we also have uh, a large uh, community. It's very interesting because when we think about France, we think about only the hexagonal, the metropolitan France. But let's not forget that we have also the overseas territory, for example, Tahiti. And we do have quite a bit, maybe like about 300 people from, uh, from Tahiti here. We do have some from, 
um, from La Réunion as well. So it's, I would say it's beautiful to see all that. Uh, and when people come and get a passport or a, a, a French ID, then I have a chance to interact with them because otherwise I don't. Um, another figure that I think is uh, represent how well the French people love coming to Utah prior to pandemic, but hopefully they will come back. Uh, we have about 22,000 French people visiting Utah. And we know this because they go through St. George and when they stop at St. George, they visit the temple and then they sign. So that's how I was able to get those numbers. Um, so my role, like Dr. Lago, you know, we are here to serve and to help any, so in my case, any French person who lives here or who is transiting through Utah. Some examples, I'm going to give you beautiful examples and some, you know, that are more tragic. Uh, for example, I may have to give a laissez passer because a French traveler um, lost the passport or the car was robbed and they need to go back uh, to France uh, through Salt Lake City. And so overnight, I will issue uh, a laissez passer. Does not happen very often, but maybe two or three times a year. And this is where, you know, you, uh, the, the summer seasons are a little bit scary, wondering, okay, what do I have on my plate this next few days? And usually I have a phone call every day. Less now because people cannot, uh, because of the borders uh, being shut, uh, but uh, otherwise almost every day I have someone calling me, okay, so I lost my passport. Uh, I want to register uh, my uh, new baby. Um, I, um, I want to work in France. Uh, what can you uh, recommend? Or I need to attend this and that. So it's, I'm learning a lot each time when I have a new situation. It's almost like, you know, I could put on my telephone, uh, uh, number one, press number one for passport, press number two for laissez passer, press, you see what I mean. You know, once you start doing this over and over, it, it, you become used to it. However, you know, when we think about our French citizens being here, it's not always the dream that they wanted. And a few times I have experienced um, uh, mostly women um, in difficult situations. What I mean, I'm not talking about a, a, a broken arm here. I'm talking about abuse. I'm talking about uh, people in the street. Um, and so this is when, you know, I'm really, really in touch with the French consulates because they will tell me exactly what to do. You know, I have a little card like Dr. Lago. I show up to uh, the, um, I, I'm sure I show up at the airport. You know, I go to the counter. Hi, I have a situation. I wanted to make sure that citizen goes back to France immediately. Okay, we have an opening right here. And, you know, it has happened on the 23rd of uh, December, uh, 2018, I think, or it was not pleasant. But, you know, this is when we learn. And at the same time, we are sympathetic, but also we need to make sure we don't put our personal situation, um, I'm going to call it in danger. We cannot host those people uh, in our house, unless this is someone I know very well and I know it wouldn't be a problem. But what, the, the aspect I love about my position is I get to know a lot of people. And it's also very nice to, to help Americans who want to establish business in France because we have reciprocity. I'll share one slide with you. Um, and also it's nice to, uh, to help French people who want to establish a, a, a business here. So again, in that case, you know, I'm just, I would say the liaison between, between uh, the French consulate and, and them. Dr. Lango, also you asked me about the COVID, am I correct? That is, that is correct. Uh, before, before we pr proceed with this question on, on COVID, um, uh, you know, we echo some of the, the similar experiences that, that we share. Uh, individuals may feel that, oh, well, you know, we are not busy at all because no one is traveling, but it's, um, it's amazing the amount of work that uh, recently uh, you probably are doing as much as I am. 
uh, or individuals, Americans, especially U.S. citizens that need to travel to France or to whatever in the EU um, for work permits, for medical reasons, for family situations and so forth, right? So yes, it has been a very busy days or busy months uh, since uh, March when COVID hit. It, so uh, it has been, has been difficult. Um, but anyhow, just kind of a segue to that question is, uh, I know that France has had their share uh, when it comes to COVID. So tell us, educate us a little bit about how is France living right now the COVID situation or has lived for the past months? You know, at first it was scary. And now I think most of us are able to be calm about it. However, I, I seem to be obsessed with numbers. Um, and so I compare numbers in Utah com and also numbers there, you know. So as of this morning, there were about 74,000 deaths related to COVID. Keep in mind, we are about 65 million people in metropolitan France. The islands of Tahiti have been hit very badly as well. At some point, I had to shut down the island, okay? And we have had about 3 million, uh, attendez, attendez. Yeah, about uh, 30, yeah, 3 million 100,000 uh, cases since the beginning of the pandemic. And if you follow the news, uh, you will see that each country, each president is acting at the, I would say similarly, especially in Europe, we need to have lockdowns. We need to have uh, confinements. So at this point, we are in our second lockdown that started right after the holidays. Uh, and we have a third one on the way. President Macron is very conservative because he know that he knows that the morale is very, very low. People are affected. And so therefore, you know, if you, but it's like us, you know, if you put us in the cage or asking us, don't go out, don't do this, don't do that. If you have too many restrictions, you go crazy. And right now he's worried about the mental health of the French people. People are being vaccinated. Maybe not quick enough, but I think that's what we see nationwide. So we all have the same issue. So we will see not this week, but maybe next week, depending on the results of the confinement that is taking place now at 6 p.m. Do you realize 6 p.m.? Restaurants have been shut down since March. So it's been, the economy has been hit very, very badly. And so, you know, this also affects the mental health of everyone. Although, you know, you promise uh, what we call envelopes, you know, you have a, you know, for so many uh, companies and restaurants and domains, still people want to go back to work. So, um, so we need to reduce the reproduction rate that is escalating, like in so many European countries. I don't think Spain is any, any, any better. We see this in Italy, in, in, in Germany. When you think about those borders have been, I don't know if they have still been temporarily shut down, uh, but the idea is to really limit the traveling between places. Um, as we also know, uh, we have a travel ban between France and the US and vice versa. Again, you know, I, uh, like Dr. Lago, I have to explain to people, it has nothing to do with politics. At first people thought it was politics. It is not, we need to limit the traveling. And, you know, so this is why, you know, back to what we were discussing previously, it's like when someone tells me, well, I, I really, really need to present my, my product, you know, to get more business. Well, we also need to be wise at the same time, so. Yeah, it has been detrimental for many nations in Europe and, um... And France, uh, you know, adds to the, to the conversation as well as um, look what is taking place in the UK, for example, uh, or or anywhere. Uh, honestly, it has been very challenging. I know that the European Union is moving forward with vaccination, and uh, but they're still facing challenges as we face here in the United States. So, and um, one of the questions that I've been asking uh, some of my 
dignitary friends that have joined us through Global Dialogues is um, back in 2015, the United Nations came together and established what is known as the uh, Sustainable Development Agenda, the 2030. And, and for within 15 years, they established certain goals. And um, if you see right behind me, I have some of those goals in, in this manner. And, uh, and I'm just wondering how France is moving forward with the 2030 uh, Sustainable Development Agenda. Uh, have, you, have you felt, have you seen, have you heard uh, some of the initiatives that have taken place in France that actually is benefiting the community, the country? I know it's, it's difficult to talk about SDGs right now because of COVID, it takes such a prominent role in our conversation, but uh, what is France doing to meet the 2030 agenda uh, in conversation with the rest of, of the uh, um, 193 me uh, member states or nations that are participating in this event? You know, Valdomero, you mentioned a good point. You mentioned the, during COVID, however, maybe more during COVID, the sustainability is important. And actually, which is remarkable, you know, we have different ministries. One of them is for tourism, since it is heavy on, on the economy. But we also have the Ministry of the um, Ecological Transition. Her name is Barbara Pompili. And so that tells you how France has been involved and behind the Sustainable Development Goals. We care so much about this. We have the COP21, and France was one of the leaders actually even before that. And I remember, you know, before uh, 2015, when, when people, even in my family, France, you know, I mean, we talk a lot about lunches and they could not believe that some countries would refuse to join the Paris Agreement. And I think, you know, it, it's very um, relevant. It's called the Paris Agreement. So it shows, you know, when we want unity as well, uh, we need to bring together. But, you know, I'm very proud of what France did in that case. We also believe, you know, we have nu nuclear plants. We have a lot. And we need to shut them down. We still have 22 of them being in operation. Uh, but the idea, the goal is to really, I would say, provide positive energy for green growth. We need to make sure that we need to, 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 to eliminate anything that is not ecological friendly. We also started in 2016, and we have had several movies about that. And I think it's wonderful. This law against food wasting. Could you please, when you, could you please tell us about this? I, I think that is so powerful and so important. And I wish every single nation state could follow this model because to me is is breathtaking. It's beautiful. So tell us, please tell us about this. Sure. So, you know, when you think about when you go shopping, for example, you have when you reach the date, but, you know, for example, yogurt uh, of the 30th of uh, January will still be good. Bananas are still fine, even though you may find some brown on it. And so this law prevents anyone in a supermarket or restaurant from wasting Food because we have so many people who are in the street or students who are suffering from hunger. We don't want that. So they passed this law that has been actually extremely well received. And I read also an article about how this has been positive for France. And so how come the other nations are not doing it? We also have, uh, and, uh, to add to this, uh, there was um, uh, um, how say, um, an initiative from famous chefs in France, and also we saw it in Italy, uh, fighting against food wasting. So they went to people's house, you know, very famous chef, two or three stars, you know, restaurants in France. And so they went to knock on people's door and examining uh, what they have in their fridge. And then you, you would see rotten because they were like, well, you know, we bought too much. And you would think, like, like in the US, you know, we see the same thing. Bags, garbages full of, of ingredients that could have been used. So uh, this has been a nice initiative, you know, being an eye opener. And, and when I was aware of that, and I have also educated my students, 
uh, about this because I said, well, we need to tackle that issue here. How many of us are really paying attention to what we're doing? And then the same issue uh, has started against what we call uh, um, uh, fast, uh, no, um, fashion, uh, how is it that? It's like HM, fast, uh, um, fast fashion. And so again, I had to educate my students. Do we need to keep buying, buying and buying? And then, well, I don't like it, so I drop it. So there was the same type of initiative preventing stores from, uh, from cutting t-shirts, sweaters, socks, anything that could be used by, uh, for example, I'm gonna call it the equivalent of the DI here. You know, we have Saint Vincent Paul, we have all this. So the idea, it's less, let's help each other. And this is beautiful. This is really how we should all come together for that. It has been working. Baldo Mero, do we have something like that in, in Spain? Um, yes, they're working on that. That's certainly, yes, uh, food waste. Beautiful. Because as you mentioned, we have a lot of immigrants like Fran has and, uh, and everyone needs to be fed. So, I mean, we do here, in, even in the state of Utah, where we have, we keep calling all the time, please bring more food to the food bank. But Absolutely. they haven't had the, the initiative to bring it into a law. Uh, that any red, uh, any supermarkets that are actually losing their their produce or their merchandise, uh, they just simply waste it. They throw them away where it should be, you know, given this to venues or or entities where there are individuals may go on and pick them up or or they use them. So that is really interesting. Um, when I think of France, I think of a great nation, a very powerful nation, and very well established, and keeping up the pace with. Uh, this sustainable development goal. So I, I, I think that uh, they're doing remarkably well in comparison to other nations. But now as we look ahead in the US, as we all know, we have a new government, uh, we have a new president uh, who actually one of the first executive orders is to file uh, the petition to become a member of the pre, uh, Paris Accord, uh, the Paris Agreement, and uh, which that, brings a signal on building a stronger alliance or stronger relationship between France and the US as we have witnessed during these past years. So how do you, how do the Frenchmen are, or the French women are viewing uh, now this uh, new relation with the new government in the US? Well, I will admit that so many people and they're included, we had tears in our eyes a week ago because it was a beautiful inauguration, okay? But as you know, Dr. Lago, uh, when, we, when we have our embassies, uh, we all stay out of any political issues. So whoever is elected as the head of the state or the country, we always have, you know, we, we need to, be, um, to welcome anyone. But um, we need to keep in mind that France and the US have always, helped each other, I would say, back in 1778, when Lafayette said, here we are, nous voilà. So that was already the same, the same fight. We want our freedom. We care so much about freedom. And this is, I would say, what first brings us together. We are allies, we are friends, you know. We have common values. We usually, you know, I would say the only time uh, France and the US uh, thought differently was for the um, Iraq war. And that's okay, you know, uh, we had different views on that. But usually, well, when there was 9 11, France sent uh, not really troops, but help, aid uh, to support the US. Same for Katrina, you know. And when France was in difficulty, we received the same help, aid. From America, so we have the same. We share the same uh, views on uh, similar policies, on political economy, you know, security issues. We're against, um, I would say, um, attacks. You know, we don't want that, um, and it's okay. You know, we ha to have a, a, a frank discussions. Actually, President Macron invited uh, uh, President Trump uh, to attend. 
his first uh, 14th of July, uh, July uh, defile. So that was, you know, a sign of friendship already very, very strong. Uh, of course, we're delighted to, uh, to see also maybe uh, America having, I would say, uh, 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 I'm going to call it a new hope for this, what we, what we see. But we are delighted to see that. And we, of course, I mean, we, I mean, I, I live here and I see French people, but our goal is to continue the strong uh, relations uh, that we have had. And as you said, you know, this Paris Agreement re-signed on uh, January 20th, the first day, was already a, a big, big signal of, re I'm not going to call it reunification, but we see already that we all want to work together. Are we saying now that the U.S. is following the French motto of liberté, égalité, et fraternité? <laughs> well, you know, I see that. And also I hear, well, yeah, but France is a socialist country. No, 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 no. France is not a socialist country. But, you know, back to our history, in 1789, it was, you know, it was the abolition of the Ancien Régime, making sure, you know, we have this fraternity and this, this égalité, this brotherhood between everyone. And that is important. That is, that is great. Wonderful. Well, we don't um, have any questions coming up through, the, uh, through our uh, viewers at this point, but um, how is French being viewed, or France, better said of French, but how is France being viewed now by even our local community? I mean, there's always uh, certain reservations that people just love it or hate it, like any other nation. Okay, like any, but what has been your experience? And you, as you mentioned, well, I'm the honorary consul of France. Uh, are you quote unquote well received, or are you? I am. Oh, great. But 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 I have to admit that has also been an eye opener for me. So it means you know I need to be careful. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, um, you know, at first I remember, you know, people are hearing me in the supermarket with middle family. You know, we speak French, and so I said, well. Uh, okay, uh, go and get some carrots, go and get this and that, you know, do you like this or should we take that? And people, you know, turn around, oh, you speak French? You know, at first when I, when I arrived in July, 2012, I did not expect so many French people here or so many French speakers. I, at first I said, yeah, you know, how come they're all intrigued that I speak French? But very quickly, people were pleased, so happy to, to, to share with me that they spent 18 months, two years, three, four, five, X amount of time in France and that they have always loved France. You have no idea. You have no idea how it feels good. You know, because we heard, you know, uh, maybe 20 years ago when all, you know, this uh, French bashing, uh, let's not call them French fries, but freedom fries, it was very painful. I love the US. If you recall my first slide, I had a little French flag with the US flag. And I need to find a little pin like that because I am proud to live in both nations and to help both French, but also Americans. And so, you know, here I've been extremely well received. We need to keep in mind, if I recall, I think we have one third of the, um, of the LDS missions taking place in a, in a French speaking country. Mm -hmm. And that we need to keep in mind. This is why, you know, so many people, not only French people, but being so pleased to, to hear natives here. We have a large community, as I mentioned. We, we, we do a lot of things to, to keep it vibrant as well. And also to invite, you mentioned the Alliance Francaise, uh, two thirds of the members are Americans. They are francophiles. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's it, it's beautiful. So what we what we do is actually we have very few uh, French natives in that, and it's okay. But the idea is to share part of the French culture with them, and also, you know, it's it goes culture one, culture two. But it's also nice to receive feedback um, and, and to have always this comparison, and this friendship always comes back between France and America and vice versa. I love it. Not always easy, you know. Once in a while, of course, we can find exceptions. But it's everywhere, you know. 
Madame Lev, we just got a question right now from an individual from Christopher Atkins that he's asking, what sort of religions are most prominent in France? Good question. If you look at Chauvet's, the number of uh, Catholics uh, will decline. Originally, you know, if you think about, I'm going to call them Christian, when we had the, uh, the Protestants and uh, who decided to go against the, the Catholics, uh, we were maybe like 95%. Now we're going down, maybe, uh, I think it's lower than 80%. Uh, uh, we have quite a few Muslims, which is normal based on the French history and um, the, uh, the previous colonies, you know. Uh, if you think about North Africa and West Africa uh, going to France, so that's absolutely normal. Uh, and we also have a high number of, um, of different religions. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the term atypical. Um, it could be like uh, Scientology or this type of things. Excellent. Well, um, I must confess to everyone that is following the proceedings and those that will be watching it that I'm a little biased towards France because I love France. That's the reality. <laughs> my mother, my whole mother's side is French and I have a stand or I spend much of my life in, in, in your beautiful, in your beautiful country. I encourage anyone that will listen and see and, and hear this proceedings to become more aware and competent of the French culture and its people, because it is breathtaking. It is absolutely beautiful. Great, great uh, landscapes, great gastronomy, probably the best in the world, great uh, arts. The arts are the passion. Uh, and uh, so great, great everything and, uh, and monuments. And, and I encourage everyone that is listening and those that will listen to save some a few dollars in the future once COVID fades away and uh, pay a little trip to beautiful Paris or Le Loire or, or the, the Pyrenees or any other area on the west or the east coast of even, even Marseille. And, and um, it, it doesn't matter where you go, you're always going to be welcome and, and very well taken care of and you're gonna love that experience. Again, um, Madame Lair, thank you. Thank you thank very you, much for joining us today. It has been such a treat. Uh, as you perfectly know, I. I France is part of me, so, so. I already know. This is why you and I get along very well. <laughs> That's why I'm honored to have you today. And also I want to thank all of you that are following this proceedings and they will be uh, watching it later on, but, and everyone to, that has helped this uh, successful event. Um, for your information, and next week we will also be having another global dialogue a week from today, next Tuesday, February 2nd. And we will be welcoming uh, the Honorable Consul General of Mexico, Jose Borjón. He will be joining us and uh, it will be a great treat. And tomorrow, tomorrow we have at the same time here through this channel, um, the, uh, the series called uh, Taking Action. And we will be addressing uh, the Sustainable Development Goal number 11, building uh, sustainable and inclusive cities and communities. Uh, we'll have former mayor of Salt Lake City, Jackie Biskupski, Professor Hungerford. Uh, we also have Genevieve uh, uh, Richards. She is over the sustainability aspect here on campus. And one student, uh, Reagan, she will be joining us as well. So if, um, if you want to see the full schedule of our global dialogues or taking action, uh, feel free to access our website at www.uvu.edu forward slash global. Again, as we sign off, uh, make sure that you choose to be a global citizen. Thank you, madame, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Au revoir. Merci. Au revoir, madame.